Welcome E4 Family Church. And if you're new here, welcome to the family. We're continuing with our Drawn Near to Me series, where we're taking a journey through the book of Matthew together as a church. I wanna encourage you, if you've missed any part of it, jump on our website at e4familychurch.com and get caught up. Well, we're moving full speed ahead with our prayer and fasting and reading through the Book of Matthew Challenge. I want to invite you to join us every day live for prayer and reading the Book of Matthew and discussing it together. There is power, there is impact. When two or more are gathered, the Lord tells us that he is in the midst. So don't miss out on our prayer time together. E4 Kids, your worship service starts right now at e4familychurch.com. And parents, I want to remind you of our parent guide that's on our website that will assist you in helping your child with the teachings every Sunday. If you haven't had the opportunity to worship the Lord through your giving, do so at e4familychurch.com. It is worship time. I want to invite you to not just sit down and watch the screen. I want you to take action and worship with us as we worship the Lord together. I want you to worship before the Lord, like in Matthew 2, where the Magi came before the Lord and they said, and it says they fell before the Lord and worshiped him. I want you to join in worship like the disciples when they were in the boat and Jesus stepped in the boat. It says that they worshiped him. Even so, like King David, when he was coming back in the Old Testament, it says that he worshiped the Lord with reckless abandonment. Be not just a spectator, be a participant. It takes action to worship and it takes you to worship. So I want you to join me in whatever way you feel comfortable, but join me in worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ today. Let's worship. song we could ever sing you're worthy of all the praise we could ever bring you're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me you're worthy of every song we could ever 
Welcome to the family. I hope you've been joining along with us and reading through the book of Matthew. Man, it's been amazing. You know, I love reading through the Gospels, but it's been amazing to start the year off this way, reading with my wife, my kids, and with all of you. It's been awesome. But also praying and fasting. You know, I don't know about you, but as I've been fasting, God's been just showing me little things that I need to work on. You know, as I'm drawing near to him, that word that God spoke to me in the beginning of the year, that it's not just for me or for my family, but for the body of Christ, that, that we've gone adrift. And in my own life, in my own heart, he's like, listen, there are parts of you, Jason, that you've, you've boxed me out of. And God's a gentleman. He's there and he wants to be involved to help in every area of our life. But he won't bunk, bogart his way in. He's going to allow us to, to say, listen, Lord, come. The Holy Spirit is a gentle guide. He leads us. But if he goes left and we decide to go right, that's our choice. We have a free will. And, and there are certain areas and places where I've not sought the kingdom of heaven as I should, not because I don't trust God, but because I've had too much trust in myself. Instead of seek ye first the kingdom, it's been all about seek me first. What do you think, Jason? And I just gone in that direction. And I've, I've had to repent of that because it's not the, the big things. You know what? With my marriage. God help me with my kids. God help me right with the church. God help me. But it's in these other little areas about, you know, should I go or should I stay or should I say yes to this meeting or go there, especially in this season? And there have been times where I didn't seek God. I didn't seek the kingdom of heaven. I didn't ask the Lord to lead me. I just made the decision on my own. He's like, I want to help you not just make better decisions, but if you allow me, I'll help you make the best decision. So that's a word for me that I've had to grow, grab a hold of. And so I, I'd love to, to hear from you or even to help you as you discover what God's telling you. You can text the word hello if you need prayer to 833-750-1352 or just to connect with us. Or if you would like prayer, you can also fill out a connection card. Now, before we get into the message, I want to pray because I believe God's speaking to us. But I think the bigger challenge we have is actually saying yes and doing the very thing that God's called us to do. It's a big deal when God tells me, hey, you've left me out of those areas. It's my choice. And I can say, well, I'm going to continue to leave you out or hey, I know. Or I can say, you know what, God, I'm sorry. And I can repent of that and then step back and allow him to be my Lord, my God, my king in every area. And that's what I intend to do. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters. I pray that you would not only give us ears to hear what you were saying. Not even just a mind to comprehend, but Father, that you would give us hearts to obey. So Lord, use me today to teach, to equip, and to empower. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So as we continue in our series, Draw Near to Me, we're continuing in what I'm calling part three of the book of Matthew. We basically took the gospel of Matthew, which has 28 chapters, and divided it into four sections. Uh, the first uh, first section, first seven, we talked about that in week one, the second seven last week, and today we're going to talk about uh, chapters 15 through 21. Now, along this journey, I want to remind you really quick of why we are even doing this series. Uh, the goal of this series aligns with the goal of the Gospel of Matthew. The whole reason why Matthew wrote the Gospel was to help equip, train, and prepare us for kingdom living. Uh, another way to say that is true, authentic discipleship, to help us follow Jesus in the manner in which God has, has told Matthew, and he is sharing that with us. It's really, really powerful. You see, Matthew himself was found in a place of deep, deep, dark sin. He was actually on the job sinning. He was a tax collector. And in that profession, they lied for a living. And Jesus went on the job and said, listen, I didn't call you to be a tax collector. This is not you. Come and follow me. And not only did Matthew say yes and, and abandon everything he knew, he invited some others to, to join him. He says, listen, I'm going to I want to host a party for you, Jesus. And Jesus goes to Matthew's house and Matthew invites the only people he know and it, knew and it's people just like him. It's amazing. Incredible. But not only did Matthew become a disciple, he became an apostle which is a big deal, trusted by God to be one of the key leaders in establishing the church, God's church. You see, God handpicked these, these leaders to lead us. And so we're reading his account. And now we're picking up in Matthew chapter 15. And we discover something that Jesus was the one that actually pointed this out long before grandma said it long before my mom and dad said it it is so true it's what's on the inside that counts you see i went to a school where um some of the kids man they were just violating my five senses i mean the the, the food they would bring try it and i tasted it and it was terrible it would smell bad it was awful and then one kid in particular he didn't dress right. And when he would read, he struggled. And I struggled too, but I tried to hide it, but he didn't care. Just in the middle of you know the class, reading through, just butchering the book and didn't care. And people made fun of him. But then there was one day we were on the playground and there were some kids a little bit older and they were being mean to him and they started to pick on him and, and you know just bully him. And I didn't like it. So I ran over where they were and I ended up knocking them out of the way and said, leave them alone. And I realized that, you know what, I've never really focused on him. His name was David. I didn't see past all of the things that were in violation of what I could see or what I could hear. And I began to see his heart. And I realized that, man, this guy is amazing. In fact, shortly thereafter, his mom invited me to his house for a birthday party. And when I got there, it was quiet. And then we end up going into the kitchen and she had made this spaghetti dinner for us and set it out for us. And there was nobody else there but us. And I said, huh, am I really? And she says, no, no one else is coming but you. She says, he doesn't actually have any other friends. You're his only friend. And she thanked me and she says, thank you for stepping up for him that day and, and, and telling those bullies to leave him alone. Thank you. And I realized, man, I had, I had judged him by his outward appearance. I would have never learned what I discovered, not just that night, but over the rest of my time there at that school, he became one of my best friends. He had such a capacity to love, but it was hidden because I was looking at the outward. And what we discover here in chapter 15, when Jesus says, it's just what's on the inside that counts, that the Pharisees were so caught up in the ceremonial washing of hands that they weren't paying attention to what really is going on on the inside. That they dressed nice and they looked nice and they did all the things on the outward. But the Lord said, that, that's meaningless. He explains it in a parable and a parable is such a revelation because this is all about kingdom living. That Paul, and I mean, Peter's like, I, I don't understand. And picking up in verse 15, it says, and Peter answered and said to him, uh, explain this parable to us. So Jesus said, are you still without understanding? And I love Peter. He's like, yes. 
<laughs> Jesus is like, do you not understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? And we're not going to go beyond that. You get the picture. You eat it, it goes. But verse 18, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts. Those boys hurting my friend, it was from their heart. Murders and adulteries and fornication and theft and false witness and blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands, do not defile a man. Now listen, I see people not washing their hands and eating. I got a problem, not because of their eternal salvation or any of those things. Because I just think, look, look, it's nasty. You didn't touch this. You didn't touch that. Wash your hands. But the Pharisees weren't concerned about them getting sick. They were concerned about their tradition and their laws. And the Lord said, listen, I'm concerned about the state of your heart and you're concerned about the way you look. The way you look will not get you to heaven, but the condition of your heart, friends, oh my gosh. And ultimately our hearts, they're defiled, all of us. None of us have clean enough hearts to get to heaven. So Jesus' whole assignment was to help us get clean hearts. So how could he do that? Well, it's because Jesus is God's son, the anointed one. And this is what we discover in Matthew 16. This is powerful. A question is asked to Peter and the disciples that we all need to answer for ourselves. Beginning in verse 15 of chapter 16, he said, Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? You see, he's having a whole conversation with the disciples and he's been with them now over two years. He's like, all right, y'all know who I am. You eat with me. You talk with me. You've seen me perform miracles. Who am I? And before they could get the words out, they, they're there and they're perplexed by the question and Peter answers. You are the Christ, the son of of the living God. You see, this was a big question because up until this point in time, they, they had this idea and this thought of Jesus that he was a man sent by God that had extraordinary ability just like Moses or just like Elijah, right? That was their thought process. But while Jesus is asking the question, the Father, God the Father shows up and he speaks to Peter. And Peter gets this revelation and not fully understanding it. He blurts it out and then Jesus responds. He says, Jesus answers and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. This is a miracle that you got this right. You couldn't have come up with this on your own. And so the thought and the idea is overwhelming. But the only person that actually has evidence about this is Peter because he heard it in his ear. But as they continue to walk, we understand why we need to listen to Jesus, not just based on Peter's testimony, but we need to listen to Jesus because beginning in verse, verse one of chapter 17, it says, now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. Just the three of them. Jesus would often do that. He would talk to the multitude and then sit down the 12. And then he would take from the 12 just the three. These were the close inner circle where he was sharing some very specific things to them because of the responsibilities they would have later on in the establishment of the church. And he was transfigured before them. That word transfigure is metamorphosis. You see, up until this point in time, they had glimpses that this guy was somebody unique and special, sent from God from heaven. He's walking on water. He's turning water into wine. He's multiplying loaves and fishes. But now look what's happened. He transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun. Imagine you're just talking to Jesus and his face is bright like the sun. And then his clothes became white as light. I mean, white and white as the light. But verse three, 
and behold, if it wasn't enough to see Jesus' face looking like the sun and his clothes white, verse three, and behold, Moses, Moses died thousands of years ago. And Elijah, he was taken up into heaven by chariots of fire, appeared to them talking with him. There's Jesus. And this is important because standing there is Moses representing the law. He wrote the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. We know for sure he wrote. And Elijah representing the prophets. And standing in the middle of the two of them is Jesus. And then Peter answered and said, oh, wow, Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. See, the problem, he is still thinking in terms of Jesus being on par, in alignment with Moses, who was a great man, and Elijah, who was another great man. But they were still people that were created by God on an assignment, doing things under the power and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But they themselves were human and they had birthdays. But not Jesus. And while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. You see, in chapter 16, Peter heard it personally. But now Peter not only heard the sons of thunder also heard James and John. And not only did they hear, but they see with their own eyes the glorified state that not only is Jesus 100% man, but he is also 100% God. And they saw the glory of who he was standing right there before them. But Jesus came and he touched them and said, arise and do not be afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus. Moses is gone. Elijah is gone. And who's standing there is Jesus. The other thing that Jesus though was helping us understand, listen to him. But then he starts teaching them about forgiveness, that this is how the kingdom of heaven works. It's all about mercy and grace and things that are foreign concepts to this world. He says, listen, your sin is so great. But I've come to forgive you of that sin. But what I want you to do is to not just receive forgiveness. But it is a gift to also give. And Peter's got a hard time with this. He goes, wait a minute. Okay, all right, all right. So talk to me about this. You know, Jesus is telling them about how to reconcile with your brother. Listen, how you get back in good relationship with us, with me, with God the Father is through me. Okay, so you get that? And I forgive you. But after I forgive you, Peter, what I want you to do is to forgive your brother. And Peter's like, okay. So, all right, how many times do I need to forgive my brother? And he comes up with a number. Peter does seven times. And Jesus goes, no, Peter, seven times 70. Like, listen, remove the number, Peter. How many times do you want me to forgive you? And Peter, they still have a hard time. And Jesus tells this parable. And it's an amazing parable. He tells a parable about a guy who owes the king money. A lot of money. It's a debt that he will never pay in his lifetime. When the king calls him on his debt, he comes and he's before the king. And the king's like, listen, you don't have enough money to pay me. And I'm looking at what you owe. You'll never have enough money to pay me. So I'm going to put you, your wife and your children, all of you in prison forever. And the guy just cries out and humbles himself and begs for mercy. Give me more time. Give me time. And the king says, listen, tell you what, you're forgiven. And just cancels the debt completely and totally. No payment plan. Complete and total, scot-free. He doesn't say, hey, just pay the interest. No, scot-free, you're good. 
And then what does the man do to celebrate? You know, he, he sees someone that owes him some money and, and you would think, you know what? I was just forgiven a debt that I, I could never repay in my lifetime. I've been forgiven. Hmm. He sees someone that owes him money that's really pocket change. It's a debt that's manageable, that could be paid back in time. And so hearing the great news about his own forgiveness, instead of passing it on, he grabs his fellow servant. And it says he begins to choke him and demands that the man pays him the little pocket money that he owes him. And all of the people in the neighborhood find out about it. And they're like, man, this is terrible. This man owed the king money he could never pay back. And this dude only owes him pocket change. And he's doing that to him. And they run quick to go tell the king. And the king comes. And in verse 32, it says, And his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. You begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? You see, the kingdom of heaven is a kingdom based on mercy. It's not a meritocracy based on what we deserve. I earn this, I earn that. In fact, you don't want the kingdom of heaven to be that way because it would only be for perfect people. And last I looked, there are none on this earth. None of us are perfect. No, the kingdom of heaven is based on mercy and grace. And we get there because Jesus paid the price, the penalty that we couldn't pay. So he's saying in the same way I forgave you, freely forgive others. But as they keep going, the, the possibility of getting into heaven and who can get to heaven, who can't get to heaven becomes a, a very heavy topic. And this rich guy shows up in Matthew chapter 19 and, and he's got a, a, a really awesome testimony. Like he's doing well financially and he has really lived according to most of the top 10 commandments and he meets Jesus and he goes, hey, Rabbi, Lord, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What do I do? Because I'm enjoying this life and I'm looking forward to the next. So tell me. And Jesus goes, hey, all right, about your life and how you're living, how are you doing? And Jesus doesn't start with the first top 10 of the commandments. He doesn't start with number one. He, he gives them a few of the other commandments. He says, how are you doing with these? And the man replies quickly, man, I've been, I've been killing it. I've been doing all of those from my youth. Is that it? And Jesus goes, all right, you want to be perfect? And he's like, yeah. I mean, I'm pretty close already. Tell me what I got. I know this is going to be a short list. And Jesus replies and says, all right. Um, rather than Jesus asking him, how are you doing with the first commandment? Jesus test him with the first commandment. He says, listen, you have a lot of stuff. Give it up. Go give it away to the poor and follow me. Be one of my disciples and you'll have riches in heaven. And the guy couldn't do it. He could not obey the first commandment, which is to honor the Lord thy God, to not have any other gods before him. And money had become his God. He was consumed by it. It's nothing wrong with having money, but it's a problem when your money has you and God doesn't. And so as a result of that, what we discover is that it's impossible for us in our own ability to get to heaven. So what we have to do is we have to trust in Jesus because all things are possible through him. And then in verse 19, 23, then Jesus said to his disciples, assuredly, I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, I got to stop there. Uh, the middle school that I went to, they made all of us take a class where we had to learn how to cook and sew. They said this was something that was missing in homes and they, they put us in this class. And I remember my teacher, she was teaching all of us how to sew. And she handed us a needle and some thread. And we spent the first part of the class learning how to put thread through the needle. And it was, it was stressing me out. And so I'm thinking how hard it is to put thread through needle. This right here, though, Jesus is like, mm, I want you to know that. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. 
I see that visually because it was hard. Clearly, a piece of thread is designed to fit through the eye of a needle, but a camel is not. And even those that have heard about the stories about the camel going through a part of the rock of, on a mountain there that's tiny. Listen, the bottom line is, it's Jesus said it's impossible. And when his disciples heard it, they were astonished, saying, then who then can be saved? But I love Jesus's response. He says, but Jesus looked at them and said to them, with men, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So the encouragement for us is it is possible through God, but it's impossible in my own strength. And instead of accepting Jesus's word to receive what he was seeking, he walked away sad and discouraged because he didn't want to separate with his God his mammon God, his money God, the things that he was consumed with on this earth. And as we keep going, we learn Jesus is taking them deeper and deeper to an understanding of his kingdom. And then we discover something completely opposite to this world. We learn about who the greatest in the kingdom of God is, beginning in verse 20, uh, 25 in chapter 20. But Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them? And those who are great exercise their authority over them, yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom to many. You see that word there, Son of man is in reference to Jesus himself. And he says, I didn't come here for you to worship me and to fall down before me. That's going to happen. But my purpose of coming here this first go round was to teach you kingdom living. I came here to show you what it looks like to be a human and to walk this earth that he was 100% God and, and deserved our worship. And he, and he was fine with people worshiping him, but he didn't come here the first go round just for people to fall out and worship. He came the first go round right here. He tells you, just as a son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He came for the whole goal and the whole purpose to redeem you to save you, to redeem me, to save me because he loves you and he loves me. He literally gave himself up for us. And all throughout his time on the earth, even on the last days, he continued to serve us because he loved us. Such a perfect example. And then he reveals to us the big mission and the the goal of what he was trying to do to get us, but also to restore some things in his house, that his house is a house of prayer. And I want to paint the picture of what's going on here in Matthew 21. The people are getting excited because they now believe in the prophecy about the Messiah that's coming and they're aligning everything up and they're going, Jesus looks like the one. And Jesus is fulfilling prophecy, riding on a donkey into Jerusalem. This is Palm Sunday. It's amazing. It is a celebration going on. The people are there waving branches and they're like, man, Hosanna, Hosanna. And they are worshiping God and so excited. And they're like, man, it's time. The Messiah is here. And as he's riding his donkey, they're like, oh, what was he doing? He's not going towards Rome. Instead, he's going towards the temple. And they're like, what is happening? Because you're the Messiah. You're supposed to go and overthrow the Roman government and set up David's kingdom here. You're the one. But he was letting them know about the kingdom that he was coming to establish. Instead of going to Rome, Jesus instead in Matthew chapter 21, verse 12, it says, then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple. And he overturned tables. That's right. That's my God. Tables of money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. 
And he said to them, it is written that my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. But look what happens after he cleans house. Verse 14. Don't miss this. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. They came to the place where they should come and they weren't met by thieves because Jesus chased them out. They were met by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. What's the Holy Spirit saying to you through this message? What's he speaking to you in this season? As I've said to you, as I began this prayer and fasting, the Lord has revealed to me that there are parts of my heart that I've kind of boxed them out. And I had to repent of that and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Rather than seeking first the kingdom of God, I've been seeking me first. And I repent of that. And so I want to invite you. What's the Holy Spirit saying to you in this message? Let's pray. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray that their ears would be open, that you would speak to them, that if there are areas in their life, God, that are not in alignment with you. Even, Father, what I've been trying to do, but Father, there are certain areas in my life where I haven't been, certain areas where I've missed the mark, certain areas where I have purposely put my faith in myself instead of trusting in you. Father, I pray for those that are listening that maybe that's where they are. Maybe they have felt let down in the past, God, because you didn't answer the prayer the way they wanted you to answer the prayer. But I pray, God, if they have bitterness in their heart towards you or others, that today would be a day that they would give it all to you and that they would allow themselves to take a step closer to kingdom living. I pray in Jesus name. Amen. Well, I invite you to take your next step uh, to know God personally, to hear God, that we can hear him. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and a stranger they will not follow. And ultimately so that we can trust him and follow him. And if you want to do that, if that's you, go ahead and text the word hello to 833-750-1352 or fill out a connection card. God bless. And I can't wait to connect with y'all as we continue this journey of the book of Matthew challenge. And then next week as we conclude with part four. Love y'all and God bless.